backstory. There are two ways to think about this. One is it's a calorie issue. That's the conventional wisdom. You eat too much, you get fat, it doesn't matter what you're eating. A calorie is a calorie is a calorie, and it's all about energy. So take in more energy than you expend, you store the excess in your fat tissue. The other way to think about it, which is that when we get fat, it's a, it's a growth disorder, it's a hormonal defect, a regulatory defect. And now the interesting, the way to uh, think about the foods we eat is what effect do those foods have on the hormones and enzymes that regulate fat accumulation. And kind of an entirely different paradigm. And if you think about it this way, every nutrient you consume, protein, fat, carbohydrates, even the type of carbohydrates, even the type of fats, have different effects on the hormone, specifically this hormone insulin, that regulates fat accumulation, actually regulates the storage of fat in fat cells. So if you think about it that way, and this is an idea that sort of had its uh, provenance in pre-World War II Germany and Austria, where obesity researchers had come to think of obesity as a hormonal defect, not an energy balance problem, and then it picks up in the early 1960s with the discovery that the hormone insulin regulates fat accumulation. So if you think about it that way, then the problem with modern diets, the reason people get fat is not because they expend more, take in more energy than they expend, but because the carbohydrate content of the diet stimulates insulin secretion, and that insulin secretion stimulates fat storage. It's pretty much that simple. And until the 1960s, the conventional wisdom was that carbohydrates were uniquely fattening. Nobody knew really what that meant, but the idea was that if you didn't want to be fat, there were specific foods you didn't eat, and they happened to be you know, bread, rice, potatoes, beer, um, sweets, anything with sugar in it. Um, medical schools like Harvard Medical School, Stanford Medical School, Cornell, in the, in the, in the mid-20th century, they published their diets for obesity, and their diets was, don't eat these foods, bread, pasta, potatoes, anything made from flour, sweets, etc., and you can eat as much as you want of these foods, you know, meat, fish, fowl, green vegetables, because the foods you're not eating are fattening, and the foods that you can eat as much as you want it are not. It was pretty much that simple. So that's one of the arguments I've been making for the past you know, 10 years now, is that every other growth disorder that doctors study is known to be a disorder of sort of hormones, enzymes, receptors, genes, um, not this energy balance thing. So all we have to do is say, look, why should we consider obesity any different? And if we consider it just like every other growth defect, then the obvious causes are Again, the hormone insulin is involved, just like with diabetes, and um, the carbohydrate content of the diet. It's not how much you eat, it's what you eat. Okay, the problem is too much fat. You know, on a woman it might be fat below the waist, on a man it might be fat above the waist, so um, you can just ask a simple question, what is it that puts fat and fat cells, because you have these overexpanded fat cells, you probably have too many fat cells, and the question is what regulates that? Um, because whatever it is that regulates that is probably the cause of obesity, you know? Um, and that was worked out. It, it took a couple of inventions, discoveries in the 1956, the discovery of how to measure fatty acids in the bloodstream. In 1959-60, the discovery of how to measure hormones in the bloodstream. But with those two new technologies, new assays, by the early 60s, it was clear that the hormone that regulates the accumulation of fat and fat cells is insulin. And our insulin levels are pretty much determined by the type of carbohydrates we eat. It's, pretty, it's that simple. And yeah, it was staring us in the face. The problem is it was an inconvenient truth to steal a phrase from Al Gore. Um, you know, we were this all worked out at a time we were beginning to blame dietary fat for heart disease. And if dietary fat caused heart disease, um, then what you want to do is get people to eat fewer, less fat and more carbohydrates. And well, let me rephrase that. If dietary fat causes heart disease, you want people to eat low-fat diets. So you get rid of the fat. Um, since most protein comes with fat attached, what you do is replace it with carbohydrates. So 
get rid of the fat, increase the carbohydrates, that becomes a heart healthy diet that will protect you from atherosclerosis. But then how can that be true if the carbohydrates are going to make you fat? It depends, unfortunately, on what kind of low-fat, high-carb diet. Uh, if you are a Southeast Asian and it's a low-fat, low-sugar, high-carb diet, probably none. Unfortunately, we're not Southeast Asians, or at least many of us aren't. And so now the problem is, what if you have a low-fat, high-sugar high carbohydrate diet. And there's significant evidence today suggesting that sugar causes a condition called insulin resistance. When you're insulin resistant, sugar meaning sucrose, the white powdered stuff we put in our coffee and on our cereal and high fructose corn syrup, which is the form you find it in most um, uh, liquids like sodas and fruit juices. Um, so if you have a high sugar diet, and the sugar, there's evidence, a lot of evidence say that sugar causes a condition known as insulin resistance. When you're insulin resistant, your body requires more insulin to control your blood sugar, and your blood sugar goes up when you eat carb-rich meals. So the idea is that the sugar causes a environment in your body that requires you to secrete more insulin to the carbohydrates you're eating, and now that high-carb meal will cause obesity and potentially type 2 diabetes and potentially heart disease, even cancer, Alzheimer's, all these chronic diseases are associated with each other. Um, so, you know, if this theory is correct, if this way of thinking is correct, what you want to do is A, obviously avoid the sugars in the diet, and then B, if you're already obese or diabetic, restrict the carbohydrates as well. One of the things that's always confused this is because Southeast Asians ate high-carb diets and were so healthy, I mean, their rates of obesity, diabetes, heart disease were very low compared to ours, and breast cancer rates are almost non-existent. And, and for instance, Japanese women living in Japan compared to American women living here. Um, the assumption was that the carbohydrates are benign. This was one of the situations that drove the idea of a low-fat diet. Look at how little fat they eat in Japan. Look at how healthy they are. Ergo, we should all eat a low-fat, high-carb diet. But what they weren't paying attention to was that they also eat very little sugar. And so, again, the, the argument I would make, right or wrong, is that the sugar sets up this hormonal environment that then makes the high-carb diet problematic. And now, in order to cure it, you got to get rid of the sugar and or the high carbs as well. Attention, somebody's going to ask the question, what about Japan, what about Vietnam, China, wherever, where they eat carb-rich diets and diabetes rates and heart disease rates and obesity rates are all traditionally very low. And the answer is the problem is that they eat very low sugar diets, traditionally exceedingly low. In Japan in the early 1960s, they were consuming the amount of sugar that we were consuming in the 1860s. So they had virtually no diabetes, but we had virtually no diabetes here in the 1860s. So the question is, is it the carbs are good for you and we should avoid fat, or is it that the sugar is bad for you? And, you know, a, a high-sugar diet with a high-carb diet is going to be a disaster. Right. Absolutely. Here's what happened. Let me give you the history. So in the 1950s, a fellow named Ansel Keys comes to this hypothesis that dietary fat causes heart disease and saturated fat, and it does it by raising cholesterol. Um, through the 1960s, they did a whole series of experiments trying to demonstrate that a low-fat diet or a cholesterol-lowering diet, which reduces saturated fat and increases polyunsaturated fats, was healthy and would make you live longer, and it actually couldn't be done. Um, some of the studies suggested some benefits. Some of the studies suggested the opposite, that these diets actually increased your likelihood of dying prematurely. Um, so by the mid-1970s, the science was completely in flux. Uh, but the press had been writing about it for 15 years, and the scientists had been talking about it for so long that people started to believe the hypothesis was true, despite the inability to confirm it in experiments. 
So then in 1977, a congressional subcommittee gets involved. Well, they get involved in 1976, this uh, Senate Committee for Nutrition and Human Needs run by George McGovern. Uh, McGovern had founded the committee a decade earlier to deal with hunger in America, and they had instituted some very uh, um, important uh, school lunch programs, uh, things like that, to deal with hunger. And then they started running out of things to talk about, so they thought the staff, which young lawyers mostly, said, hey, you know, we've been dealing with undernutrition. Maybe we should deal with overnutrition. And so they had a hearing, two days of hearings, and then they had a, a staffer, a very well-meaning individual, wasn't really well-versed in either science or nutrition, write up a report. And this was published in January 1977. It was a dietary goals for the United States. And it suggested that if we wanted to avoid obesity and heart disease, we should go back to the diet that the USDA kind of thought we were eating based on estimates and speculations at the beginning of the century, which was higher in carbohydrates and lower in fat. And this was then picked up by the US Department of Agriculture and turned into um, the first uh, dietary guidelines for Americans, which was phrased with all kinds of caveats, but it generally said we should be eating more carbohydrates and less fat. And then in 1984, after a couple of huge studies were done, one of which was a diet study that was completely negative, and one of which was a drug study that suggested that lowering cholesterol through drugs could lose weight, uh, excuse me, <clears throat> that suggested that lowering cholesterol through drugs could prevent heart disease. Um, <clears throat> the um, National Institutes of Health has a con holds a consensus conference and concludes that every American over the age of two should go on a low-fat diet, and which means you should eat more carbohydrates and less fat. And Time Magazine has a very famous cover, uh, Cholesterol and Now the Bad News, and it's a plate. So this was a drug study, but it's interpreted as relevant to diet. So the idea is if you can prevent heart attacks and live longer by lowering your cholesterol by drugs, you should be able to prevent heart attacks and live longer by lowering your cholesterol by diet, which sounds reasonable, except it's just an assumption. Drugs do many things. Diets do many things. A diet that lowers bad cholesterol because it has a lot of saturated fat also has negative effects on good cholesterol because of the saturated fat. And so you don't really know if the diet and the drugs are going to be equivalent because of all these other things they do. But anyway, the government has this consensus conference. The Time magazine jumps on it with this famous cover story. Picture of a plate with two fried eggs is the eyes and frowning piece of bacon is the mouth. I regret to say I was alive and working at Time Inc. at the time, and it changed the way we all ate virtually overnight. And you can see it in the data from that period on, from the late 1970s onward, we increased the amount of calories we consume, but the calories we consume are virtually all carbohydrates and sugars. There was also a theory floating around at the time from a University of Massachusetts physiologist that you couldn't get fat unless you ate foods with fat in them. So foods that were all carbohydrates, like Coca-Cola, now became foods that could not make you fat. So you could eat, if you bought into this idea and it was kind of floating around the zeitgeist, then you could eat any of these foods and remain lean. The problem is, you know, the eggs and the butter and the sour cream and the, the meat, which has fats in it and the like. And this was reflected in the food guide pyramids where suddenly bread, pasta, potatoes, rice, all these foods that in the early 1960s were still considered uniquely fattening were now foods that should be the staple of our diets. Um, you know, the carbohydrate has transformed over this 20-year period from uh, a food that's uniquely fattening. One of my favorite lines is the first line of a British Journal of Nutrition article in 1963 written, co-authored by one of the two leading British dietitians, and it's every woman knows that carbohydrates are fattening. This is a piece of dietary wisdom with which no nutritionist would disagree. And then by the mid-1980s, these foods have become heart-healthy diet foods. We're all eating baked potatoes for lunch every day and avoiding the sour cream and the butter. 
you know, pasta goes from a food that you eat once a week to a food you can eat. You know, Thursday night when I was growing up was pasta night because, you know, we thought pasta was fattening. Um, by the late 1980s, pasta is a food you eat every night, and every dinner party you went to was, you know, the post would serve pasta because it's cheap and it's easy and you can have your... Um, so there's a sort of transformation in how Americans eat. And the foods that used to be kind of the heart of an American diet, you know, the steak and eggs and butter, and um, suddenly become sort of the agents of our demise, the foods that are going to give us heart disease, and they're replaced with these foods that are low in fat, high in carbohydrates, used to be considered uniquely fattening, are now considered heart-healthy diet foods. So why did that... Why did that grab people's um, imagination so firmly? <clears throat> you know, there's a th it's an interesting question, and I'm speculating. I mean, there are a lot of factors that enter into it. Uh, Post-World War II, we became obsessed with weight and health. Um, Newspapers started having health columns and nutrition writers and um, diet books started being published one after another. Um, for the first time ever, government scientists were telling us what was a healthy diet. That was what made the McGovern Committee report so um, monumental in a sense. It's the first time ever the government had ever made a statement about what constitutes a healthy diet. That it happened to be a, a, a Senate committee that had no legal authority to enact laws was irrelevant. That just seemed to be an authoritative statement. Then the NIH, the National Institutes of Health, gets into the game. The U.S. Department of Agriculture gets into the game. Um, nobody had ever done this before. It was brand new. And, you know, there are certain subjects that humans seem to be inherently interested in and, and anything having to do with how long they're going to live in their health is one of them. You could, you can sell magazines and books by writing about it. So it just it caught fire in a way that had never happened before. I don't know why. I mean, again, there all these factors came together and the demand was obviously there. And you know, people care. But again, you also have to remember that I'm coming from, I, I lived in a particularly um, you know, there are still people who don't care about the connection between nutrition and health, and it could be a large proportion of the population. So those people who think that, you know, obesity is just caused by eating too much, basically think that the people who get too fat are the ones who just don't pay attention. So they're too ignorant or too um, uncaring or for whatever reason, they just, they're just going to continue eating too much regardless of how much they're told not to, and they're going to eat unhealthy foods because they... Um, they don't know any better. So there is, you know, there's a large part of the population that still doesn't pay attention. Um, and this is an explanation for why the conventional wisdom doesn't work for those people who think the conventional wisdom is right. Um, but the part of the country that reads the papers regularly, watches the evening news, you know, that really cares, they, they had a sea change. And, um, that were every day I think it gets more and more extreme. Yeah. I actually got into this industry because I was so, I mean, I got into this science journalism uh, looking at nutrition because I was kind of offended by the bad science that was being done pushing, you know, getting us away from salt, getting us away from dietary fat. And I spent a year for the journal Science doing investigative stories, first on the idea that salt causes high blood pressure, and then on the idea that dietary fat is the primary evil in American diets, and I thought the science is terrible. And I was angry that these people had, yeah, I hadn't eaten a spoonful of peanut butter or an avocado for 10 years because of reading the papers and thinking it was going to kill me. And then I ended up deciding carbohydrates are the problem, and now I'm like worse than any of them. And, you know, I'm the last person anyone wants to ever have dinner with because then they can't order their pasta or have dessert without feeling guilty, or at least so they feel. Right, right, right. <laughs> I, know, yeah. I know that feeling. Yeah.
Okay, sugar and high fructose corn syrup. So sugar is a molecule of glucose bonded to a molecule of fructose. So it's 50-50 glucose and fructose. And high fructose corn syrup is its most commonly consumed. is supposed to be 55% fructose, 45% glucose, a little more fructose, a little less glucose. They're monomers, which means they're not bonded together. Although the sucrose often breaks down when it's in um, liquid form into monomers. So it's debatable how different they are. Um, when I first started writing about this, I worked from the assumption is much of the research showed that they're identical. Uh, the body treats them identical, or the effects are f in the human body are, uh, for all intents and purposes, identical. They're both sugars, and defining sugars now is a carbohydrate that has a lot of fructose in it. Fructose is a carbohydrate that makes sugar sweet. Um, recently, there have been some studies suggesting that high fructose corn syrup is often 65% fructose. Uh, I don't know if that's true or not, to how uh, reliable those studies are in terms of, you know, not just what they found, but whether what they found is, uh, um, you know, can be uh, assumed to be true all over the United States. And then secondly, there's some studies suggesting that high fructose corn syrup is a little worse than sugar, sucrose. Um, the question is, is a little worse something you want to be discussing? So um, it's not that sugar is harmless and high fructose corn syrup is bad, although some people speak like that. It's that if what we're arguing is true, then sugar is bad and high fructose corn syrup is a little worse. <laughs> um, if we were to get rid of all the high fructose corn syrup in the world and replace it with sugar, sucrose, um, the world would not be that much better off. If we were to get rid of some significant amount of both high fructose corn syrup and sugar, I believe the world would be. So that's kind of the difference we're talking here. Now what's interesting about this, when high fructose corn syrup in the form in this 55-45 formulation was introduced in the U.S. in 1977 and took over the uh, replaced, it was actually formulated so that it would taste pretty much identical to sugar in Coca-Cola and Pepsi, and it was replaced the sucrose in Coca-Cola and Pepsi by 1984, and it had begun to sort of take over the world. So when you look at sugars, what the FDA calls caloric sweeteners, um, sugar consumption, sugar availability starts to go down in the U.S. in the late 1970s, and it's replaced by high fructose corn syrup, and then the two together increase roughly 30% between the mid-1980s and 2000 when it peaks. Um, so the argument is, you know, this could be driving the obesity epidemic, but not because high fructose corn syrup is so much different than sucrose, but because we simply start consuming more of these sugars in total. That's a most parsimonious explanation for why you see the, a concurrent increase in obesity and diabetes. What's amusing is when high fructose corn syrup came in, I mean, ironic and amusing, uh, the corn refiners did everything they could to make it appear that high fructose corn syrup was not sugar because <clears throat> the sugar was being perceived as a generally kind of noxious item of the diet. Some doctors believed it caused diabetes. Um, and so there was kind of an anti-sugar trend in the 1970s. And the, when high fructose corn syrup came in, it benefited from this. And they could, you know, on, on um, ingredients labels on sodas and soft drinks, you could see you have to list it by the amount that that ingredient is in. The, so instead of saying, you know, water followed by sugar followed by chemicals, it said water, high fructose corn syrup, chemicals, and if you didn't know high fructose corn syrup was sugar, and the corn refiners would refer to high fructose corn syrup as fructose, and fructose as fruit sugar, and it all sounded very natural and healthy, and I think to some extent that's why the sweetener consumption started to go up, because we just didn't know this stuff was sugar, and it seemed to be benign. Um, now we fast forward 25 years, you know, 2010, 2013, and suddenly high fructose corn syrup is getting hammered by people as a potential cause 
uh, of the obesity epidemic, often by people who don't realize that high fructose corn syrup and sucrose are so chemically similar. Um, and I've met many of those people who think the problem is high fructose corn syrup because they don't realize that sucrose is half fructose. And now the corn refiners want to say, no, 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 we're, we're, we're sugar, we're the same thing. So after spending the 1980s establishing that they weren't sugar, they now want to take it all back and be able to claim that they're sugar because in comparison, sugar is the one that now seems benign. So interesting politics. The argument I would make is that the evidence to me is pretty compelling that sugar is bad and high fructose corn syrup might be a little worse, but not enough worse to differentiate and say we'd be better off if we were just consuming sugar. Okay, so here's the idea. Um, and this is what separate. One of the things that separates glucose from fructose is glucose gets metabolized by virtually every cell in the human body, but fructose, for the most part, gets metabolized in the liver. So if you consume, say, a uh, Dr. Pepper with 200 calories of high fructose corn syrup. Um, so you got uh, 110 calories of fructose and 90 calories of glucose. In theory, the glucose goes to every cell in your body, but the 110 calories of fructose gets dumped on your liver. And if you drink it in five minutes, it's a pretty powerful load of fructose being dumped on your liver. And then your liver cells have to decide what to do with it. And they're working like crazy to metabolize this stuff and they turn some significant amount of it into fat and the fat gets sh shipped, they try to ship the fat out on these lipoprotein particles, um, low density lipoproteins that cause heart disease or supposedly cause heart disease. So you've got the liver working like crazy to deal with this fructose load and the argument is that we didn't, it never evolved to deal with fructose in this form and at this kind of uh, uh, potency. You know, there's fructose in apples, and but if you wanted to get an equivalent amount of fructose in, from eating fruit, you'd have to eat, say, four or five apples, and you couldn't do it in five minutes, and it would take a while to digest it, and you probably wouldn't want to do it. So the liver just isn't capable of doing this, and the idea is in the process of trying to metabolize this, it, start, it starts to become what's known as insulin resistant. And this creates systemic insulin resistance. So you start from what's called hepatic insulin resistance, hepatic being a term for the liver. And then you generate from there this kind of backlog that causes systemic insulin resistance. And also that the fat that it's trying to clear, um, you know, it's turning the fructose, some of it into fat, and trying to get it out of the liver. And while that's happening, other fat is circulating through the liver, and this starts to cause a backup, and you start to get fatty liver disease. And there's some studies showing that you can resolve fatty liver disease very quickly by just getting rid of the sugar out of the diet. Um, again, none of this evidence is definitive, but if you're open to the idea that sugar is a problem, it's compelling. If you're not, it's just not definitive. Um, so that's the issue. Any of these, this fructose, chemists would say the fructose moiety of sugars, of sucrose and high fructose corn syrup, because of the effect on the liver is what makes them worse than other carbohydrates, what makes them deleterious. The question is, how harmful did they know it to be? And this is what sets me apart, despite writing that article, this is what sets me about from most of the other sort of nutrition commentators. Like, I don't know if you, yeah, you probably talked to Marion Nessel. So Marion loves to blame industry. Um, to me, the scientists completely screwed it up. So here they are in the 1970s. There's evidence that sugar is really problematic, okay? There's the evidence that it causes, you know, they didn't really understand insulin resistance then, but the understanding was growing, and it, this would, there were a lot of signs that could argue that sugar is a fundamental cause of type 2 diabetes, so adult onset diabetes, the diabetes that associates with obesity, and that by a fundamental cause, meaning if we didn't have sugar, we wouldn't have diabetes of that kind. Maybe not either kind, but certainly not type 2. Um, so that evidence is building. But the research community, the nutritionists, all these influential people are blaming fat for everything. And they're ridiculing the guy 
who sang It's Sugar, John Yudkin in the UK. So if you're running the sugar industry, at what point do you pay attention to the minority view that's being ridiculed when the really influential nutri nutrition obesity researchers are backing you 100%? I had dinner a week ago with the guy who was arguably the most influential obesity researcher in the U.S. in the 1970s and 1980s. And he told me about that the FDA did a, a, a review of sugar, first in 76 and then again in the mid-80s, and they basically gave sugar a free pass. And I think they completely screwed up. Although they stuck to the letter of the law, what they were supposed to do, which is if the evidence isn't absolutely conclusive, then we're going to say this substance is generally recognized as safe, and we're going to let people consume it. And we're not going to say what I would have looked. Yeah, it's generally recognized as safe, but there's all these indications that it's not, so let's do this study and that study and this study and nail it down. Anyway, the FDA comes out with this report, and this obesity researcher said he read it, and he signed off on it because he thought fructose was harmless. Now he thinks that fructose is, you know, that even apples should have skull and crossbones on them. But then he thought fat was a problem, and everyone else thought fat was a problem, and so at what point, if you're, if you're running the sugar industry, what's your obligation to be smarter than the nutritionists and obesity researchers out there? Now, with the tobacco industry, they were, you know, the data were there, they knew the data were there, it's like, it was compelling data, it wasn't, it was becoming mainstream, um, and they had their own, they had obviously gone out of their way to manipulate tobacco to make it as addictive as possible. Um, I mean, even with sugar today, you know, most researchers would say, I don't know if it's addictive or not. My counter to that would be, do you have children? Like, I don't need fancy science to tell me if sugar is addictive. I've got a four-year-old and a seven-year-old. You know, it's pretty clear that this functions as a drug for them um, and not a healthy one. But the science is ambiguous. So are you supposed to know better than the research community and say, we're peddling something that you guys are not doing your job right? We think it's worse than you do, and, you know, we're going to, whatever, shut down production, and Coca-Cola's going to go out of business, and PepsiCo, and, you know. I mean, it's trickier. Yeah, and that's the thing, unless you do, and this is what science should be about, one of my criticisms of the science, I was just talking to my colleague at this Nutrition Science Initiative about this. Science used to be about imagining all the ways you could get it wrong, and bringing in everybody you could to help you imagine all the ways you could get it wrong, and then doing experiment after experiment after experiment after experiment to try and rule out possible alternative scenarios for what you think you've discovered, and if it took 20 years to do that, when you're hoping you could do it in one, you, that's just the way life was. You spend 20 years, but the way science works now in the U.S., we don't do that anymore. And people don't want to do the hard work. I mean, first of all, they have to generate results so they can get funding in order to convince the people what's important. It would be great if their articles got into the New York Times. So people get into this thing where they're like selling their science like a used car salesman is selling a used car, ignoring, instead of thinking of all the ways they could have gotten it wrong, they just kind of ignore them or bury them or sweep them under the rug because they're inconvenient. And the truth is the National Institutes of Health is not going to fund a 20-year research project just to assure that what you think you know is really true. So there's this fundamental systematic systemic problem with how science is done, and it, I hope it, it's at its worst in nutrition. But that may just be because I haven't looked closely at some other sciences. Uh, it, it's uh, like any dogma. Yeah. It's if, if you hold on to an idea just because you like the idea, you're, you're deluding yourself. Well, and one of the things that happens here is people, if you get a result that confirms the idea, then by, ver by definition you must have done the experiment well. Mm -hmm. And if you get a result that seems to contradict the idea that everyone else also holds dearly. You're not going to get funding, so you better figure out why that experiment was wrong and do it again. And all these biases enter into it. Right. Uh, you ever heard of... Um
why is the solution not just to eat less? Because the problem is not probably not caused by eating too much. So then this is always, this is the issue that I've been writing about. And so we've had these competing hypotheses. One is we get fat because we eat too much. You know, we exercise, we expend too little, depending on which one of these axes you want to put the, the emphasis on. So if that's the case, and eating less should solve it, A, it is true that you can starve people. You know, I recently put together a PowerPoint presentation where I used as the evidence for the energy balance picture a, you know, a photo of some British prisoners of war, <laughs> you know, after like 30 months in captivity, and hey, they're emaciated. You know, therefore, this demonstrates that eating less is a cure for obesity. Although if you follow those guys, probably three years later, they'd be in as chubby as anyone else. Um, that's a reason to believe it. So you can starve people and they'll lose weight. But the, the counter argument is you could starve children and stunt their growth. And nobody would think that their growth is caused by eating too much. And you could starve cancer cells and stunt their growth. But nobody would say that cancer grows because it takes in more energy than it expends. Um, if you look at do randomized control trials where you put people on calorie restricted diets, what used to be known as semi-starvation diets, and I think that terminology was dropped because um, it implies that nobody could ever stay with it. You couldn't semi-starve people forever. Um, anyway, when you look at, at clinical trials, they, they, you can't show an effect from calorie restricting. Most people don't. You know, they'll lose a little bit of weight over the first few weeks, and then the weight slowly comes back. Um, but to me, again, the argument is, um, is you know, more profound than that, more fundamental. It's just, if you just think of this as a growth defect, which it is by some definition, you know, a disorder of excess adiposity, then... The first question you would ask is, what is it that regulates adiposity? What regulates the accumulation of fat and fat cells? And that brings you directly to insulin, and that brings you directly to carbohydrates. And if you just say, you know, by the mid-1960s, it was clear that the way to get fat out of fat cells was to lower insulin levels. And the way you lower insulin levels is by reducing the carbohydrate content of the diet. So there's no reason to think that eating less should have a long-term effect unless what you're eating less of, or eating fewer of, are the carbohydrates in the diet. Well, okay, if sugar makes us fat, one thing to keep in mind is obesity is very closely associated with diabetes. So that means if you're obese, you're chance of being diabetes is increased dramatically. If you're diabetic, the chances are that you're obese or very high. Um, they're both associated with uh, hypertension. They're both associated with heart disease, meaning that the more obese you are, the more likely you are to have heart disease, and people with heart disease are more likely to be obese. They're associated with cancer. Um, they're associated with Alzheimer's disease, and all these diseases cluster together in populations. So there was this concept of diseases of Western civilizations, and these are all diseases that you see in populations and eating Western diets, living Western lifestyles that you don't see in isolated populations that didn't eat Western diets. So there's very high probability that they're all caused by the same thing. So if it's sugar that makes us fat, then it's quite likely that it's sugar that causes diabetes, that it's sugar that causes heart disease, that it's sugar that causes most cancers, and that it's sugar that causes, you know, you, you name it, any of these Western diseases, or sugar and the other refined grains in the diet. So and that's the argument. And then one of the themes that runs through all these disorders is the role of insulin. Um, John Lane? She's fine. She's fine? She's on the show. Okay. Um, cancer, for instance, uh, which when I went into my research, had I decided that there was a particular nutrient in the diet that was uh, the dietary trigger of cancer, I would have thought this was quackery and I could never write this. Um, and what's interesting is that the conventional wisdom today, because cancers are associated with obesity and diabetes, the assumption is that they are indeed somehow caused by the things that 
cause obesity and type 2 diabetes, but the assumption is that that's eating too much and exercising too little. So there are researchers out there who will think of cancer as sort of a disease and diabetes as diseases of sedentary behavior. Now, I find that kind of perverse because, for instance, it means by sitting around talking, we're engaged in carcinogenic activity, and that seems kind of crazy. Um, but if obesity and type 2 diabetes are caused by the sugar in the diet, fundamentally triggered by the sugar in the diet, um, and the way researchers, one way to think about it is you have this concept of genotypes, that's your genetic program, your genetic code, and then that genotype exists in a particular environment, and for that environment triggers something in the genotype, and now you manifest what's called a phenotype, which is the way the genotype manifests itself in a particular environment. So we have today this dramatic increase in the obese and diabetic phenotype, and the question is what triggers that, what environmental trigger? Is that sugar, refined grains, is it fat, is it sedentary behavior? Um, so I'm arguing the evidence to me pretty compelling that it's sugar, maybe sugar and refined grains. Um, how would it do this? And what you see is that this hormone insulin again runs through all these disorders. So type 2 diabetes is a disorder fundamentally of insulin resistance. And we've talked about the possible role. <laughs> Uh, it is possible that for athletes, yeah. I mean, one of the my takeaways from the data is it's conceivable that the benefit of exercise, endurance, athletics is that, or any kind of hard physical labor is that it helps dispose of the carbohydrates you consume in a way that doesn't require your body to do so much work, secrete so much insulin, and cause ultimately so much harm. But then the problem is, and, and this is actually something Lustig likes to talk, he thinks exercise is very beneficial because of this. I think, well, just don't eat the carbs. You know, maybe that's more beneficial rather than working like heck to get this, you know, antidote to them. And then it, it could just be a short-term effect anyway. So it's like 36 hours. So conceivably, you could work out your whole life and then stop. And after two days, you'll be just as unhealthy as you would be if you didn't, you know, unless you cut significantly back on the carbohydrates. But, um, you know, the other thing with exercise, it tends to select out people who tend to burn carbs rather than store them, right? Because if the carbs are the things that makes us fatter and you look at endurance runners and those are the people who burn the carbohydrates, who preferentially metabolize them. The term I would use is a partition the carbohydrate fuel towards towards energy expenditure rather than towards, you know, driving step fat storage. And so when you look at, for instance, um, you know, uh, the runners, the, 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 um, you know, the leaders in marathons, and they come in and they often look like they're running out of Auschwitz, you know, some German concentration camp. I mean, these people look emaciated. I, I don't think they're emaciated because they run marathons. You know, I think because their bodies don't want to store calories as fat, they want to burn them, that they just, and because they're very relatively light, they're not carrying all this extra muscle and, and fat, then it makes them very good at what they do. But a common misconception for the past 30 years is because these people are lean, that you could then just take someone whose body is predisposed to store calories as fat and make them um, lean by turning them into marathon runners, and the data just doesn't support this. Actually, one of my favorite studies was published in 1989 by a Danish group, and they took 18 men and women um, couch potatoes, and over the course of 18 months, they trained them to run a marathon, and they did run a marathon, which I find amazing, because I'm a big guy, and I can never do more than eight miles before my knees give out. But these people actually ran a marathon, and the researchers reported that at the end of the eight month, 18 months of training in the marathon, the men had lost, on average, five pounds of body fat, and the women had zero percent change in body composition. Nothing. And then the researchers speculated that the reason they had zero percent change is because they increased their carbohydrate intake to make it easier for them to run the marathon. So it's sort of, um, you know, it could be beneficial, but my gut feeling is if it's beneficial, it's because it 
it um, it, it you know deals with this carbohydrate excess that we live in. It also makes um, orthopedic surgeons rich. So I think that's <laughs> something to keep in mind. <laughs>
we digest it, how quickly our organs have to deal with it. And the faster that is, the more likely they are to do damage. And it's, it was a pretty simple idea. And yet it's still, oddly enough, I mean, it's part of the idea of the glycemic index as a way to address this. But there's no index that says, look, you know, if I eat the sugar in eight apples over the course of a day, but it's spread out over hours, um, is that going to be more or less harmful than if I drink the equivalent of amount of sugar from those apples and I, you know, class of apple juice that I could consume in two minutes? And the answer, I would say, is it's, you know, even if this idea is wrong, that it's never been really studied is kind of mind-boggling. Yeah, so this is, um, we should talk about this whole history. One of the things that people don't pay attention to is the history in this field. And that's one of the things I've tried to bring back to it, is there is a rich history. You know, when you learn physics, for instance, you learn the science with the history attached. And, and many people who never studied physics but are well-educated know the names of people like, like Einstein and Schrodinger and Planck. These are kind of uh, familiar names. But in medicine and public health, we pay no attention to this history. It's kind of gone. It's as though it never happened. And now it's inconvenient because it contradicts a lot of what we believe. But one of the things um, that's fascinating is uh, Post-Civil War in the United States and around the world, there was uh, diabetes epidemics, and they were very dramatic. Um, in some U.S. cities, diabetes rates increased 15-fold. And um, some of this was assuredly what's called a diagnostic effect, because it used to be that if you wanted to see if somebody was diabetic, it meant they had sugar in their urine, and you had to have your physician would have his assistant taste the urine to see if it tasted sweet. So you could imagine that this wasn't a test that got done a lot. Um, then they developed a way to measure sugar in the urine, and life insurance policies came in, and suddenly a lot of men were getting tested for diabetes, and lo and behold, they had it. But a lot of this increase seemed to be real, seemed to be just more and more people were getting diabetes. And by the 1920s, uh, some of the leading authorities in the field were saying, look, sugar is the obvious culprit. Sugar consumption has also increased dramatically. In the last 50 years, from the 1870s to the 1920s, we saw the creation of the confectionery industry, the candy industry, and the, the soft drink industry. Suddenly, Cokes and Pepsis are everywhere, and candy bars are everywhere. and um, so the obvious suspects seem to be sugar. Uh, this got buried uh, because the leading authority on diabetes in the post-insulin era, a guy named Elliot Jocelyn, didn't believe it, in part because of what we had talked about, that the Japanese ate very high-carb diets, they didn't have diabetes, and Jocelyn didn't understand that sugar was different than other carbohydrates, uniquely different. Um, and then in the 19... 60s, this guy Peter Cleave comes along. So Cleave is a um, uh, British naval surgeon who's traveled all around the world with the British naval, Navy, and he's seen this observation that populations in different parts of the world have entirely different um, patterns of chronic disease. So the chronic diseases you see in Southeast Asia are entirely different than the chronic diseases you see in London or Philadelphia. Um, and this led him to this theory that the culprits were refined grains and sugars. Wherever you had a lot high levels of refined grains and sugars, you had the heart disease, diabetes, obesity, gout, um, cancer, etc. And one of the diagrams he showed in his book was a chart showing the increase in sugar consumption with on the same chart the increase in diabetes mortality um, from I think it was about the turn of the 20th century onward and these two graphs these two lines basically paralleled each other almost exactly so sugar goes up and diabetes mortality goes up and then you get to World War One and sugar consumption drops and diabetes mortality drops and then World War One ends and sugar consumption starts going back up again and diabetes mortality starts going up and then you get to World War Two and boom sugar consumption plummets and diabetes mortality plummets then it starts going up again um, very compelling. It doesn't show cause and effect, it doesn't demonstrate cause and effect, but it was a very compelling chart. And anyone that cared about diabetes should have taken seriously. And again, by the time Cleve was doing his work, the conventional wisdom was becoming that dietary fat is a problem. So sugar is harmless. One of the interesting 
arguments against the sugar hypothesis was post-World War I, sugar consumption goes up and diabetes mortality levels off a little bit. And the problem is, is that in 1921 they discover insulin. So suddenly they have a treatment for diabetes that they didn't have. And so the rational thing to say was you'd expect diabetes mortality to level off a little bit because suddenly it's not killing as many people. You can treat it because we have insulin. But this wasn't how they thought. I don't understand why this wasn't how they thought, but they didn't. It was like, if you believe... <laughs> Where was that from? Grinding gears. It's, and medicine is a, you know, there's this phrase in medicine science, medical science is a uh, oxymoron. You know, it's just, um, I, I think my primary problem with medical research is it tends to be very authoritative. In, in the field I grew up in, in physics, you know, you question everything. But in medicine, you're, there are uh, authoritative figures whose word is considered sort of law or they are gods and you, um, and whatever they say must be believed. And if there's evidence to the contrary, you just ignore the evidence. Um, and this just happened time and time again in this, in this uh, chronic disease story. Uh, you know, you could argue in the sugar industry would that we really don't know the truth because it, definitive studies have never been done, which is true, but it's sort of, there's a large body of evidence that was just ignored because it was so inconvenient. Um, let me just tell you the insulin resistance story. And so one thing to keep in mind, remember again, in, in the 1950s, Ansel Keys comes up with this theory that dietary fat causes heart disease by raising cholesterol. And in the 1960s, we tried to, it's, it's tested by maybe a dozen different trials and it just can't be confirmed. I mean, some of the trials show that it, you lower cholesterol, you live longer. Some of them show that you lower cholesterol, you die earlier. Um, but it doesn't stop this theory from being embraced. Like the existence of the hypothesis became reason to believe it's true. And along the way, they throw out Cleve's refined carbohydrate hypothesis. They sweep Yudkin's sugar hypothesis under the rug. They're all con inconvenient. Um, <clears throat> but while this is happening, beginning in the mid-1960s, Jerry Reeven at Stanford starts unraveling this concept of insulin resistance. Um, through the 70s, he's doing his research. By the 1987 or so, he's finally getting a lot of notice for this work to the point that the National Institutes of Health has a consensus conference on how what to feed diabetics. And Reven is there arguing that insulin resistance is a primary problem with diabetics and it's a carbohydrate problem and they don't know what to do with them. Because sort of some people are saying don't eat protein, some people are saying don't eat fat, and now Reven is saying don't eat carbohydrates. But this insulin resistance story keeps growing and getting stronger and stronger and stronger. And suddenly we, we now we know that obesity is an insulin resistant condition and type 2 diabetes is an insulin resistant condition. If you're insulin resistant, you have a higher risk of heart disease and a higher risk of cancer. And now Alzheimer's seems to be an insulin resistant condition. And the question is, what causes insulin resistance? Because getting heart disease isn't about having high cholesterol. It's about having this entire sort of cluster of metabolic disturbances that at the root seem to be driven by this insulin resistance thing. And one of the things that Reven did in the 1980s, he needed a animal model for insulin resistance for what's now known as metabolic syndrome. And they realized that you could cause insulin resistance in lab rats effortlessly by feeding them sugar. So you feed them enough sugar, and yeah, it was a lot of sugar, and you get insulin resistance and all these cluster metabolic abnormalities, their blood pressure goes up, their HDL cholesterol goes down. I mean, you know, whatever, however you define insulin resistance, boom, you get it in a rat by feeding them sugar. Um, and this still didn't make people wonder whether or not sugar was the problem. You know, now, finally, by the 2010s, we're doing it. But for years, this idea, you know, you want to give a rat gout, 
feed it sugar. You want to raise a rat's blood pressure, feed it sugar. You want to give it insulin resistance, feed it sugar. It's sort of the easiest way to do it. Maybe sugar is a problem. Nicely done. Well said.